From the patient files of Dr. William Wickman, director of Hillbrook Insane Asylum. Patient 805, Lillian Dolly, aka the Black Widow. A fairly generic nickname, I would have to say, but a very suitable one nonetheless, as you'll soon find out. So where do I even begin with this one? A real troublemaker she is. 805 refuses to eat anything, as according to her, she can't eat normal food. We've thus been forced to put her on IV at all times, to prevent the poor deluded idiot from dying of malnutrition. 805 also take any opportunity to try and seduce the male members of our staff, including myself. I just laugh at her attempts, but yesterday I caught Barry smooching with her in her cell. It took the efforts of two guards to pry him away from her. Poor Barry, he's apparently not getting anything at home. Somehow I'm not surprised. Due to this incident, I've made the decision to only allow female orderlies and nurses handle patient 805 from now on. She never tries anything with them. We still have problems with 805 though. Just this morning, her rather extreme case of arachnophobia sent her into a fit of hysterics. Apparently there was a tiny spider web in a corner of her cell. I of course had it removed, but she's still recovering from the experience. What a case this one is. To explain the case of patient 805, I think we need to go back to one evening at a bar called Elegance. It wasn't the start of 805's story, but it is the start of our story. So settle in there, listeners. Unless you're too young, then I suggest you tune out now. This one may be a bit too much for you. The first thing Bob noticed when he entered Elegance was a woman sitting in a corner booth all by her lonesome. How could one not notice her? She was the shapeliest and most pleasant looking woman Bob had ever seen. He glanced at her as he stepped up to the bar and then sat down on a stool. He ordered a whiskey on the rocks and kept casting quick glances at the alluring woman while the bartender fixed up his drink. Her hair was long and silky black, her skin pale white. She was dressed in a fancy, very revealing black dress and wore black evening gloves. Between the fingers of one of her gloved hands rested an oversized cigarette holder. The woman puffed on it occasionally, blowing the smoke away to the side. On the table before her stood a drink of some kind in a cocktail glass, maybe a brandy Alexander judging by the color of it. Between the cigarette puffs she would take occasional sips on the drink. Bob then got his drink and finished it within a few seconds, ordering another one. He was here to get drunk. The woman gazed out into the bar with seductive eyes, like she was calmly surveying the place. Surveying the place for what, Bob wondered. In a way, he hated the woman. Hated how cool and relaxed she seemed. And he hated her because he knew she would never be his. Never in a million years would a woman like that ever even look at a man like him. Man wasn't even an apt description of him. Worm was more like it. That's how Bob felt anyway. Bob Simpson, bank accountant, or rather former bank accountant, for the time being anyway. Bob had been fired two weeks prior. Two weeks prior to that, he had been divorced. Divorced from Margaret, his wife of 15 years. Now his hated ex-wife. It had all begun a year ago when Bob suspected Margaret of having an affair, and thus hired a private detective to spy on her. It turned out that she did have an affair, and when he finally confronted her about it, foolishly feeling their marriage could still be saved, she confessed to it all, gladly, and then simply laughed in his face. It was like she was proud of it. No, it wasn't pride, it was out of spite. Margaret hated Bob so much it felt good to confess to it all. Seeing Bob's face as she described her saucy encounter with the other man was priceless. A memory she would always cherish for the rest of her life. And just like she had suspected, Bob did nothing about it either. Instead of punishing her and demanding a divorce on the spot, he began to beat himself up over it. It was all his fault, and he promised to change. How pathetic. If only Bob could understand that this exact attitude was what had gotten them in this situation in the first place. Margaret was married to a worm, an insect, and she hated him for it. Of course he knew all that now. Now he finally understood. After a while while sitting at the bar, Bob stopped glancing at the sultry woman in the booth. What was the use? Even entertaining the thought that the two could ever even exchange words was ludicrous. After two whiskeys, he ordered yet another. Usually Bob drank White Russians or San Francisco's, but now all he desired was a serious case of intoxication. He had spent the entire day going from job interview to job interview. It wasn't easy getting new employment when your former boss gave you such negative recommendations. 
Bob's boss, Charles, Charlie Boy, had always hated him. Ten years younger, yet Charlie Boy had risen ten times as fast at the bank. At the age of 32, he was already in charge, while Bob was still pushing pencils. Cocky snot nose Charlie Boy. His cufflings cost more than Bob's house. Well, former house. Margaret got the house, of course. Bob now lived in a small apartment just a couple of blocks away from Elegance. Charlie Boy felt that Bob's divorce had had a negative impact on him. No shit. And he had begun to neglect his work. Maybe he had, maybe he hadn't. So what? Cut a guy some slack for Pete's sake. Charlie Boy hadn't, of course. Bob knew though that his alleged neglect was just an excuse. Charlie had wanted to fire him since day one. Charlie was a real man. Successful, charming, charismatic, dashing, ambitious, funny. Everything that Bob wasn't. Just like Margaret, he hated Bob for his pathetic weakness and couldn't stand having him around. Bob imagined that Margaret's lover was probably a lot like Charlie. Many times had he fantasized about getting a gun and then shooting Margaret, her lover, and Charlie boy. Afterwards, he would turn the gun on himself. Now, as he gulped down his third whiskey, these fantasies entered his mind yet again. And why not do it, he figured. What was stopping him? It's not like he had anything to live for. Might as well go out with a bang. Literally. Just as Bob was about to order his fourth glass of whiskey, he was startled by the sudden appearance of a black-gloved hand sticking an oversized cigarette holder in front of him. The hand daintily ashed the cigarette into an ashtray that was sitting on a bar counter next to his empty glass. A sultry female voice then asked, Mind if I sit down? Bob couldn't quite understand what was going on. He turned to look at the person and discovered that it was indeed the woman from the booth. She stood leaned against the bar counter, gazing deeply into his drowsy eyes as he looked completely dumbfounded. He began to stutter, Sh sure, I, I mean no, I don't mind. The woman smiled and sat down on a stool next to him. Bob, nervous like never before, despite three whiskeys in his system, turned away to stare straight ahead. Her being this close, addressing him, made him feel incredibly uncomfortable. His hands even began to shake and he pulled them off the counter to hide it. Why would she be coming here, he wondered. Why would she be asking to sit down next to him? Mind if I buy you a drink? She then asked. Bob couldn't believe what he was hearing. What was this? Some kind of gag? Was Charlie Boy pulling a joke on him? Had he sent this girl to mess with him? Or was it Margaret? It must have been one of them, because no way was this on the level. Maybe she was a huckster trying to con him. Yeah, that was it. She had spotted him from her little booth and pegged him for a grade A chump. Well, might as well play along for now. A free drink's a free drink. Uh, well that's mighty kind of you, he answered. I don't know how I could refuse that. She called for the bartender and asked what Bob just had. Whiskey on the rocks, he said, and she ordered two of them. Apparently her name was Linda. She worked at a beauty salon. With her looks, she could have been a model. Her boyfriend, Brad, had dumped her a few days ago for her best friend and co-worker at the salon. She must have been really something, that friend of hers, if one dumped Linda over her. Bob figured it could all be a yarn, of course. Still, he listened. He then told her his story, naturally touching it all up a little, making himself seem less pathetic. After hearing it all, Linda revealed that she had been fired too. Apparently, her ex-best friend and co-worker was related to the owner of the salon, and if one of them had to go, it was pretty clear who that one was. Well, ain't that a coincidence. Linda then bought the two another round of drinks. What the hell was this? Was Bob dreaming? Had he fallen asleep on the counter after all those whiskeys? Not only does this woman approach him and talk to him, but she also buys him drinks. He almost wanted to ask her straight out, what the hell are you doing? It was all so bizarre. Just when Bob thought it couldn't possibly get any more bizarre, it did. Linda gently placed her gloved hand on his, softly caressing it. She then leaned in and whispered into his ear. She had a place nearby. If they wanted to continue this, they should do it there. Linda then leaned back again, her eyes fixed on his, a seductive smile across her gorgeous face. Bob's hands were shaking more than ever now. What should he do? It all seemed so suspicious. Did she have a guy with a gun waiting at her place? But Bob didn't have much money, and she didn't seem that impoverished herself. After all, she was capable of buying drinks for people. What kind of robber would do that? Was this truly for real? Did she simply feel attracted to him? Was he some kind of rebound after she'd gotten dumped? 
Bob wouldn't mind that, being this woman's rebound was the best he could ever hope to be in life. He looked her curvy body up and down, then stared into her eyes. All that booze made him at least a bit more confident. He then said, sure, acting as cool as he possibly could. Linda then got up from her stool and reached out her hand for him to grab. The two then waltzed out of the place, her wrapped around his arm. Bob felt like he was James Bond and imagined every single guy in the joint stare at him with envy. The salon was a paid pretty well as Linda's apartment turned out to be a fairly plush place. An uptown apartment with lots of space. It was scarcely decorated, some pieces of art hung here and there, a few sculptures stood on display in a couple of corners, one single sofa in the living room and a giant flat screen TV. Of course, it wasn't the living room they were going to occupy. She practically pushed him into the bedroom and threw him onto the king size bed. Before he knew it, Linda was ripping at his clothes and had her tongue shoved inside his mouth. He tried to match her enthusiasm and ripped at her clothes. Soon he was all beard before him. The most beautiful sight Bob Simpson had ever laid his eyes upon. She then pressed it all against him. And I guess I shouldn't get too explicit here. This is YouTube after all, not Pornhub. Let's just say Linda was the dominant one and stayed on top for the duration of the uh, activity. At one point her stomach growled, which appeared to embarrass her, but Bob only found it endearing. Who doesn't get hungry during intercourse anyway? After it was all said and done, finished, over with, peaked, climaxed, you get the picture, Bob realized something. He stared up at the sweaty Linda, who still hadn't dismounted, and knew right then and there that he loved her. She was like an angel, a very dirty angel, who had walked into his miserable life and blessed it. This night had been the best Bob had ever experienced. Never had he ever felt this alive and this happy with Margaret. Not once during all those 15 years. For the first time in maybe months, a big smile formed across his face. Bob then felt something sting his neck. A bug, maybe? Linda had her hand on where it had stung. She then removed the hand, and he saw that she was holding a syringe. Bob's eyelids began to feel awfully heavy. He could barely keep them up. Soon he couldn't at all, and they closed shut. Everything went dark. The last sight he saw was the naked Linda sitting on top of him. His smile never went away. Lillian threw on a bra and some underwear. Linda was of course just a fake name. She then pushed off Bob from the bed. He fell to the floor with a thud, face first. What she had given him was merely a sedative. He would come around in about an hour tops. Lillian had to work fast to avoid any unnecessary complications. She grabbed Bob's arms and began to drag him across the bedroom floor. He wasn't a very heavy man, so it wasn't too difficult for her. She never did pick heavyset men for this very reason. Opposite the bedroom was a bathroom. She dragged him in there. A very roomy bathroom. No actual bathtub, only a shower. Lilian placed Bob's unconscious body in the shower in a sitting stance, resting him against the wall. As soon as she let go of him, his head slouched down like a lifeless dummy's. Lilian exited the bathroom. She waltzed across her living room and opened up a cabinet in the far back. Out of the cabinet, she pulled a large red bolt gun. The kind you use for cattle. With bolt gun in hand, she returned to the bathroom. Bob was still leaned against the wall like a sack of potatoes. Drool was dripping from his mouth. Lilian approached him, held up his head with one hand and with the other pressed the barrel of the bolt gun against his forehead. She squeezed the trigger. A loud squishy thud. The bolt penetrated his skull and went straight through his brain. Bob would not come around after this. Lilian left the bathroom once again, returned the bolt gun to the cabinet in the living room, and picked up another few items. An electric razor, several big see-through plastic bags, and a bone saw. With these items in hand, she returned to the bathroom. She placed all the items on the floor, except for the razor, then sat down next to Bob. Ten minutes later, he was completely hairless. The razor was discarded, and Lilian picked up the bone saw. She began with Bob's left foot. After it was removed, she placed it inside one of the plastic bags. She then took the other foot, moved on to the legs, the thighs, the hands, and so on, until Bob was like a disassembled puzzle. Each individual piece was placed in its own plastic bag. 
When it was all done, she carried the bags into another room. This room was empty, except for a large freezer unit in the corner. Lillian threw each bag into the freezer, placing Bob's torso on the bottom, then piling the rest on top of it. Except for one of the thighs, that one she kept for herself. Her stomach growled. She then cleaned up the bathroom, washing away all the blood, and there was lots of it. Afterwards, Lillian made herself a drink, vodka straight up. While she enjoyed it, she began to prepare Bob's thigh in the kitchen. She peeled off all the skin, cut off the desired pieces of meat, washed them, and hacked them into slices. She selected a few of these slices and threw them onto a frying pan, while the rest were placed inside a new plastic bag, which she put in her refrigerator. It was well into the morning by the time the slices were fully cooked. All in all, this entire procedure, from beginning to end, including picking up Bob at the bar, had taken a good amount of hours. She had all the time in the world though, and zero responsibilities. Single, no kids, no job, living on the vast inheritance her uncle Frank had left her. Lillian's stomach continued growling. She was starving. She hadn't eaten anything for quite a while after all, not since her last victim. All that booze she had to drink on an empty stomach in those bars wasn't exactly making her feel too well either. But then again, she couldn't have gone through with any of this unless she was drunk out of her mind. And go through with it she had to, for her own sake, for her survival. One must feed, must one not? And now it just so happened that Lillian Dali could only eat human males. After having intercourse with them first, of course. That was just how it was. Sort of like sexual cannibalism in certain types of spiders. Lillian naturally wished it wasn't so, but there was nothing she could do about it. Them simply the breaks. And you thought I was crazy. Lillian placed the slices of Bob on a plate, sat down by her kitchen table, and with fork and knife began to shove Bob into her mouth. She chewed it like a wild animal, quickly shoving another piece into her mouth. It didn't taste very good, in fact it tasted pretty horrible, but it had to go down anyway. She never did get used to the taste of human meat, despite the fact it was all she ate. How many was it now? 45 guys? 46? Hell, it could have been 50 for all she knew. By now, she had completely lost count. Thank god each of them lasted pretty long. She didn't fancy going through this entire procedure all too often. Lillian now had her freezer fully stocked up. She would be good for at least a couple of weeks. Of course, it would have been even better if she did pick heavy set guys. Lillian looked down at her plate. Two slices of Bob left. She had already eaten over half of her dinner. Maybe it wasn't the taste that was so bad. Maybe it was all just in her head. The idea that this, which she now chewed in her mouth, was, not very long ago, a living, walking, talking human being. Its name was Bob. What was the last one's name? John. That's right, it was John. John was actually very nice, kind and gentle. It took a lot of booze to get him to go home with her. Suddenly Lillian spat out the piece of Bob onto the plate. She stared with wide eyes at the meat. She was shaking. Then a horrified scream as she violently shoved the plate off the table. It fell to the floor with a crash. Lillian got up from her seat and began to pace around the apartment. She screamed and panted, tearing at her own hair. Some of her expensive paintings went flying across the living room as she tore them off the walls and tossed them away. She knocked over one of her sculptures, creating a massive bang and sending the thing into a thousand pieces. None of this noise was heard by any of her neighbors, as her fancy apartment was naturally soundproofed. She had gotten that done early on, considering her activities. Lillian leaned against the wall and slowly slid down to the floor, crying in her hands. She sat there in a fetal position for a good half hour. All the while her stomach still growled. Eventually she got up, picked up the slices of meat from the floor, washed them under the sink, picked up a new plate and sat down by the kitchen table again. Her face was a complete mess from runny mascara. She looked down at the plate for a few seconds then began to eat again. Bob ended up lasting for about three weeks. Then it was time to go on the hunt again. 
This time Lilian chose another bar, located on the other side of town. She kept her hunting ground spread wide, as to avoid an all too obvious pattern. In total, she had four apartments located on opposite ends of the city. These apartments served as starting points. She would stay in one, then go out, find a relatively close bar or nightclub, but not too close, and then conduct her business there. For the subsequent hunt, she would start off from one of the other apartments. She'd now been doing this for years. So far, it had worked perfectly. This bar was called Stellata, a fairly fashionable place. All the places she picked were. Lilian never bothered with dives. She preferred to eat fancy. Sitting alone by a booth in the back of the place, she put on her usual routine, displaying her body in a sexual manner while sensually puffing on a cigarette holder and taking occasional sips from a brandy Alexander. She gazed out into the bar with seductive eyes. This served two purposes, luring in unsuspecting men while also scanning the place for said unsuspecting men. Sometimes she got a bite after only a few minutes. At other times it could take an hour. Then there were the times when no one stepped up. Those were the times when Lilian herself would have to do the approaching. She would always notice at least one guy oogling her, just like Bob had done. Very rarely did anyone ever pass her off or up. John had gotten close to though. After 20 minutes in Stellata, Lilian found her mark. An easy mark too. It was obvious he was on the hunt as well, surveying the place and glancing at every single woman. Eventually his eyes fell upon Lilian. A pretty handsome man he was, dressed in a navy blue suit. He appeared far more fit and masculine than Bob. The dashing fellow did not approach her though. She waited for about 15 minutes, but nothing happened. Was he shy? Hardly, not his type. Playing hard to get? Whatever it was, Lilian got tired of it and decided to once again make the first move. She pulled the same routine she often did, offering him a drink. He accepted and the two got to talking. His name was Steve, a lawyer working at Cooper & Cooper. Steve was very cocky and confident, but eventually she realized it was all just hollow, an act he was putting on. Poor insecure man, trying to be something that he wasn't, and all just to impress a woman. Most of them did that, even Bob, although his performance was absolutely laughable. Still, there was something in Steve's eyes, something that hinted at more, maybe at darkness. Lillian kind of liked it, it reminded her of herself. Of course, the less she liked the man, the better, considering what awaited them. Nevertheless, she sprung the question to Steve. Was he up for a role in the sack? She put it more eloquently though, and naturally he was. The two were then off to one of Lilian's apartments. Steve was more aggressive than Bob and she had to struggle to remain on top. She might have actually enjoyed the fight if she hadn't been so hungry and eager to get to dinner. Just get this part over with was all she could think of, so she could get to the next tedious part, dismembering poor Steve in the shower. Then she could get to the final tedious part, shoving human meat down her throat. Boy, what a fun life she lived. After both had reached the grand finale, Lilian stuck her hand underneath the mattress, like she always did, and pulled out the prepared syringe. She was just about to stick it into his neck when she noticed a gun pointing in her face. Steve had somehow produced a pistol and was now aiming it right between her eyes. What was going on? Drop the syringe, he commanded. She did, and it fell to the floor. Steve shoved her off of him, going for his pants, all the while pointing his pistol at her. Not that pistol, you pervert. The darkness in his eyes, Lilian thought. She hadn't just imagined it. She had finally stumbled upon someone who was just like her. Maybe he would at last put an end to it all. But that turned out not to be the case when Steve flashed a badge in her face. An FBI badge. Agent Kyle Dunham. Steve, lawyer at Cooper & Cooper, was just as phony as Linda was. Apparently Kyle had been looking for Lillian for a long time. All those men mysteriously disappearing in the city, last seen in bars all over town, always in the company of an elegant and very attractive dark-haired woman. Kyle had decided to put himself on the line, as it were, and act as bait. He'd been doing it for months, getting plenty of lace with dark-haired women, none of them leading anywhere, that is until now. 
While she was busy tearing off his clothes, he had subtly removed his ankle pistol and hidden it underneath the mattress, the other side of the mattress. Kyle had been very observant during the entire sexual act. He was simply doing his job after all, and immediately spotted the syringe in her hand. Soon, backup was summoned, and Lillianne was taken into custody. A forensic team determined that her apartment was full of DNA belonging to numerous of the missing men, especially in the bathroom. Her other apartments were then searched too, and the same was found there. I guess no matter how hard you scrub, you can't hide the fact you've dismembered and eaten 50 guys. When Liliane explained in court why she had done all this, how she had to do it to survive, as there was no other way for her to feed, it was pretty clear there was only one place for her. Hillbrook Asylum. Of course, you might wonder just how someone could come to believe in such a sick delusion. Well, it appears it's all the result of good old childhood traumas. Rather extreme childhood traumas in this case. Remember Uncle Frank? The man who left her his vast fortune, allowing her such a life of leisure. Well, turns out the money probably wasn't worth knowing Uncle Frank for. He was an awful, twisted and vile man. Lillian lost her parents at a young age, and was then put in Frank's care. It seemed like she would live a charm life, but that wasn't the case at all. Frank would frequently force himself upon her, periodically barely feed her, and at night always lock her up in the attic of his big mansion. The attic in question was infested with big black widow spiders. They would crawl all over her throughout the night. Frank wouldn't let her out until morning, no matter how much she screamed. This would go on for years, until he finally died under mysterious circumstances, leaving everything he owned to her. Hmm, doesn't seem suspicious at all. Well, I have to go now and place another fake spiderweb in 805 cell. Have a good night. I know she will. <laughs>